but it's in Matthew chapter 11. And um, in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 through 30, Jesus gives the biggest, the best, the greatest invitation of all time. Pastor Jeff even hit on this passage on Wednesday night in here. We were in here joining in in the Bible study. But where Jesus said, come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. I don't know about you, but how many of you like it when you're rested? I, I like it when I'm rested, when I'm refreshed. It, you know, and he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'm telling you what, Jesus gave an invitation for all of us to come to him and to get rid of some stuff, to get rid of some junk. He said, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I I just have to say, like, all is all. If you want to take all in the Greek, all is all. It's everybody, red and yellow, black and white, every ethnicity, every background. It doesn't matter where you've come from, what you've done, all. If there's an invitation for all to come to Christ. I was thinking about this, and I, I, now I had this thought, but hear me out now before you judge too quick. Just hear me out. you got to start somewhere. I had this thought in my mind, and I was thinking, man, that's so cool. Jesus is always inviting. He's, and I had this thought in my mind. He never pushes away. He never says, get away. I don't want you. He's always saying he wants us. He's saying, come unto me, and there's so much in the Scripture about that. And then a Scripture come to my mind. I'm just going to throw this out. I'm not going to preach on it. It's a heavy Scripture. But it's in Matthew chapter 7, and it hit me because... As I was thinking, Jesus is always saying, come. There's a scripture where he said, depart. <laughs> wait, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, this is where he says, not everybody that, you know, says they're of him or of him. You know, there's going to be those that say, uh, but Lord, we cast out devils in your name. We did this and we did that. And he said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never even knew you. So I'm telling you, Jesus is saying, come unto me. There's always an invitation There will be a time where he'll say, depart. I I want you to know that time will come. That time is not right now. He is not saying to you right now, no, you can't come close. You can't be in my presence. You can't can't partake with me. Now listen, not everybody is a friend of God. Let's be honest because there's this concept out there in the world that everybody says everybody is a friend of Jesus. That's not true because the book of Romans even talks about there are some that are enemies of God. So there are people that are enemies of God. They're they're not friends of God. And Jesus said this. Jesus said, you are my friend if you do what I tell you. Ah, what kind of friendship is this, Lord? I have to obey you to be your friend? Like, come on. Wait a minute. we got to remember something. He is God. We're not God. So, but here's the thing. You're like, now this seems kind of contradictory. He could say, come unto me. And he could say, depart from me. And he says, you're not, you're my friend if you do what you tell me. He said, this is too complex. No, it's not. You just have to understand he is God and you are not. And that he humbly came, died, and gave his life for you and for me. And he gave an invitation that is so big, so awesome, so available to this day. It's always will be, come unto me all. That's young, that's old, that's backslidden, that's those that have never come to Jesus. It's for the believer that you already love Jesus. It's, a, it's, it's an invitation even when you're, it's an invitation for preachers. It's an invitation for all. He says, come all. Come all. Hey, I was reading about, and I have to put on my readers because uh, I don't have all this like in my, in my mind because I'm not like a history buff. But I don't know if any of you will remember this. I had to look it up because I was like, I remember hearing about this a long time ago. But in 1986, there was a ship and it was called the Pelicano. <laughs> I, know, I know it seems silly, but unless you, now if you Google it, you'll be like, well, yeah, it's right here. But do any of you remember what happened in 1986 with this big boat called the Pelicano? Well, I was thinking about it, and I couldn't remember what it was called. But it had left Philadelphia, and it had all of the trash of the summer. Now, here's the thing. You go Google it, and you'll find all these different, like New York Times had something about it, and all these different people, and there's like all these different amounts of weight, okay? Let me just say, like, Tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of trash. This thing is a huge, you see pictures of it. The thing is ginormous and it was piled high with trash. It was all of the trash from the summer of Philadelphia and it goes out. Well, when that thing went out, it ended out for 11 months with nowhere to come in. That vessel could not come in and land anywhere for 11 months. Do you know why? Nobody wanted the Pelicano on their land. Nobody wanted it at their port. 
Um, Florida, it actually, it, 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 you can research it. It did end up in Florida. Uh, but it was like, I mean, the, 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 and, and the Bahamas, they actually met, went over to Haiti, the country of Haiti, and they dropped a whole bunch of trash there, and they did it deceitfully. Uh, but they did it, and, and they were, thought there was some kind of good exchange in this, and those guys got in trouble for doing that. But they were out there at sea, and nobody would let them in. And, and it, you know, what happened was there was a strike. So after the boat in Philadelphia went out with all of that, there was this massive strike. They had nowhere to take all this trash. So the owners that were reputable men that owned the company decided, maybe we can get out there and make some money with it somehow. They couldn't. This went on. You need to research it yourself. But I think it was like two years before finally they were able to get rid of this thing. By the time they would get to areas, everybody would say, no, it's too toxic. We don't want it. We don't want it. We don't want it. You know what happens? Sometimes in life, it's like one thing piles up and then another thing piles up and then this happens and then that happens and after a while you just kind of feel a little trashy sometimes you just feel like dirty you're like I went through this and I went through that I said this and then I did that and then there was this and then there was that and there are people all over the world and all of us can relate we've gone through times even as a Christian you can go through times where you feel like there's this event and there's that and after a while it's like you feel like I got all this trash and where can I unload it it's like everybody says, no, 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 no. Well, you can't bring that here. Now, people, you, I, I, wouldn't, I can't say this as a blanket statement that it's churches everywhere, but it can happen at church. I'm not going to say it happens at churches everywhere and put, the, put God's bride down. I'm not going to do that. I've pastored, but I can tell you that I do know that it could be a temptation for pastors or churches to sometimes we get caught up in our own thing and people come in and they've got all their trash and it's all this trash and it's toxic and they come in and it can be real easy to be like, ah, take that to another port. You can't land here. <laughs> and, and listen, we also have to be wise as a serpent, gentle as a dove. How many of you know you also got to be careful because people in leadership might have to deal with somebody in a way that you're like, well, I can't believe they're treating them that way. You may not know the whole story. You need to trust godly leadership too. Amen? So i got to say things like that because I can't just make some blanket statement like I'm putting down the church like they're not doing anything right because there's always a lot of stuff going on. But I will tell you, you can probably relate to what it's like to feel like there's just a bunch of trash, a bunch of stuff that's piled up. It can happen... It can happen to any preacher. It can happen to the greatest Christians. It can happen to people that have never come to Christ. What happens is it's like, where do I get rid of this junk? Where can I go and find rest? Where can I get some reprieve? Where can I get relief from all of this? And Jesus said, come unto me. You know what he said? He says, bring all your junk, bring all your trouble, bring all your toxic stuff, and bring it right here to me. He said, well, what am I going to do when I get there? Well, he said, come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden. Weary is not just like, you don't get a nap and get a deal with weariness. Weariness, weariness is not the same as tiredness. You can be tired, you can take a nap. You can be tired and you go on to have a vacation. And you come back and you're like, man, I'm refreshed. I just needed a vacation. But if you're weary, you go on a month vacation and come back and you're right where you was. If you're weary, it's so, it's so heavy and it's burdensome, it weighs you down. You're just like, ugh, just, it's trash, you're carrying it with you. What can I do? I need some freedom. You know what's sad is in the church when a Christian's going through hard times and they're dealing with it, we're quick to shoot our own. Wait, you're, where's your faith? You, you can't be weak. You can't have a hard time. You're a Christian. You've been serving the Lord 30 years. Well, now you can't, you can't, uh. Park your ship here. Take your toxic waste over there. I'm going to say, I want you to know that I'm going to share something with you. I'm going to be transparent, but I want you to know that I don't hold anything against these people and I don't want it to come across that way. So I'm going to be cautious how I share this little story in my own life. But my mother um, and my dad got married when my dad was 18 and my mom was 19 years of age. You know, they finished, you know, went to college. They were married in college. Dad was pastoring his first church at 19. They were in ministry together all of, all of their married life. Uh, my mom was always my dad's secretary. They were always together. They did everything together. My mom was diagnosed with cancer uh, a long, long time ago. And when she was diagnosed with cancer, the doctor said she's got six months to live. And uh, we prayed, we fasted, we sought the Lord. I prayed, I fasted, I sought the Lord. Well, it was about six months. My mom died of cancer. My mom went to be with Christ. 
My dad was all of a sudden by himself. Plans that he had that he hadn't even really thought about. You just figure that she'll be there for retirement. She'll be there for all of the kids, you know, all their events. She'll be there for the birth of all the grandchildren. She'll be there to see her grandchildren grow up. And uh, my oldest daughter just got married. Jessica was here the last two years. She just got married. And Jessica's in Indiana with her husband. Jessica doesn't remember my mom. But here's what I want to make a point at. People that loved, and I love them today, and I've forgiven, here's sometimes what happens when your ship has toxic waste and hurt and pain and garbage seems like it was dropped in your lap. Sometimes we go there with our stuff and people say, uh, you can't have problems. <laughs> you can't be a mess. That's only for people out there. But all of a sudden when there's a pastor that's grieving who has no wife and not for sure what he's going to do, I'm just going to tell you something without any bitterness in my heart. There's a lot of Christians that were ready for my dad to move on. Why? Well, how do you handle this guy that's got all these problems? What problems? His wife died. It's called grief. The only reason I'm telling you that is to just, I want us all to realize that Sometimes you feel like the trash is there. It's things that happen in life and stuff that goes on. And yet there's Jesus the whole time. The whole time. This is what's so awesome about Jesus. We have to love one another, forgive one another, be quick to forgive one another. Don't, don't, you know, don't get, hold a grudge towards one another. Uh, don't be offended easily by others. But here's the reality. The cool thing about Jesus, he's always available. He, he's never going to wrongly judge you. Oh, he's going to judge. He's the righteous judge. But he's going to judge you with right judgment. I would much rather be judged by him than by man, right? I mean, come on. But, but here's the thing. He says, come unto me, all who are weary. If you're going through pain and suffering and hardship and doubts, God can handle it. He can handle addiction. He can handle pain. He can handle it all. And I, you know, it'd be easy to say, come to him, and it all changes in an instant. But the reality of it is, there's an invitation, but there's also an exchange. Because he said, come unto me all, young, old, weary, Christian, worn out, whoever you are, wherever you're from, whatever your background. Jesus Christ says, come unto me. I'll give you rest. You can't find rest in a bottle. You can't find rest in sex. You can't find rest in a, in, a, in a pill pocket. You can't find rest through people and clubs. You can only find true rest through the Lord Jesus Christ. And He's the one who came and died that we could have life and have it to the full and have abundant life. But what do we do in the middle of all of it when we feel like we're that ship, like the Pelicano that's out to sea? And how can we get help? Just remember, Jesus said, come unto me all. I've seen little, little people, young people. I've seen them that, that they're, they're already got you know, heavy, heavy shoulders at a young age. It's really cool because we've been on the road long enough that some of the churches we go back to, I actually get to pray with guys that are taller than me. That when I prayed for them the first time on the road, they were down here and I was kneeling and praying with them. We just did a revival in Alabama. And I remember there's a different pastor at that church. They have a different pastor now. The church still has us in for revival. We have a good relationship with the former pastor, the pastor that's there now, and the people. And I remember our first revival there. We went in and I gave this one altar call. And it was crazy, wasn't it, Nadine? All of these kids... I mean, there were kids everywhere. All of these little kids came up. I mean, I'm, I'm standing up here and up on the platform, and there are kids from that side all the way over to that side. There's just a sea of children. And some of them were like 10, 11, 12. Some of them were 5 and 6 years old. And there was all these kids. And as I and Nadine, we just went and laid hands on them and started praying for them, little children would just begin to weep. Little kids would just start crying. All I can say is they just felt the love of God. They felt the presence of God. And me and her would pray over these kids. And this one boy, I'll never forget his face. He had blonde hair and this little boy. I got down and I prayed for him. And as soon as I put my hands on his little face and I started to pray, God showed me a picture. God showed me a vision of this little boy as an old man. 
<laughs> and there I am. I'm like, what am I going to do with this? He's, he's a little kid, and I see him as an old man. And when I saw this picture, I saw this old man that had, like, the glory of the Lord shining around him, and he had a Bible in his hand, and he was preaching the gospel. And so I told him, I said, I said I'm going to tell you something, but you don't have to do this with your life. I, you don't have to do this. You, you do what God tells you to do. But I said, God showed me a picture of you as an old man, so I believe he's going to give you long life. I said, but I, I don't know everything. God does. I said, but when I saw that, and the next thing that I saw was you had a Bible and you were preaching. You know what? I was just back at that church in Alabama, and guess what? Here he comes. Now, he isn't preaching out in the Bible yet. He's got his, his hat on and his farm boots and his vest. He comes up to me and he's got longer hair and he's bigger than me. He's, he's a hoss. He comes up to me and I put my hand on his head and I said, Do you remember what I prayed over you when you were a little boy? And here's what, in Alabama, this is how they, all those kids talk to us. Yes, sir. <laughs> he said, Yes, sir. He said, I remember every word, sir. And I was able to encourage him. To keep his faith and his fire alive. To stay right with Jesus. To live for Jesus. And I don't know what all he's going to do. But I thank God that, man, ever since that day, every year, I've seen him one time a year. And his mom has been able to tell me, you need to get him. <laughs> she could send me a message. You need to pray for him. He needs you praying for him. He's saying, you know, going through this, going through that. It's, it's a cool thing. But you know what? Little ones. Little ones are going through stuff too. It's not just the adults. When Jesus said, come unto me all, he also meant the children. He, Jesus said, don't suffer not the little children to come unto me. He had the little kids, they were coming and, and the adults were saying, hey, get away, get away from Jesus. Leave Jesus alone. He's like, you all better knock it off. He called those little children to himself and put them up on his lap and he ministered to the kids. Oh, he said, come unto me all oh, when you're young, when you're, when you're middle-aged, when you're a teenager, when you're confused, when you're going through stuff, whatever age, whatever stage. I remember I was preaching at an event in Kokomo, and I say an event because I, I don't know what else to say, really. It was like, uh, it was a Christian thing. It wasn't really a, some kind of a club. I, I don't remember what it was called. But there were businessmen, blue-collar workers. There were judges, police officers. Um, uh, you know, guys that get off work at the factory and come in at noon. And I go to this gymnasium, and there's like two or three hundred men in this gymnasium. And, and we did a little shaved ice thing when we hit the road to supplement our income and preach the gospel. And so it was for entrepreneurs and Christian businessmen and people that were wanting to find out about faith. And they all come together, right? And so they said, you're out there doing the work of an evangelist, but you got this shaved ice. We want you to share your story of how you are making it on the road with your wife and kids with just a little shaved ice thing living in an RV. So here I am with two or three hundred men in this big gymnasium. They're all around tables, all there for lunch. And they said, you got like 15 minutes. You got you to gotta start. You got to wrap it up. If you're going to do a prayer, it's got to all happen in this window. And they wanted notes and a PowerPoint and everything. For like 15, 20 minutes. So I just went through it. I presented Jesus. And at the end, I said, anybody in here that wants to give your life to Christ, throw your hand up right here, right now. And right off to the right, there was a round table full of gentlemen that were all over 60 years of age. Every one of them were over 60 years of age. The first one raised his hand. I think he said he was 67 years old. The next one raised his hand older than him and then one younger than the first. They raised their hands. Other people around raised their hands, but I was just blown away that three elderly men raised their hand to give their life to Christ. So right afterwards, I go over to the table and I said, I have to know, I have to know your story. I said, have you heard? Are you rededicating? And the one says, I gave my life to Christ as a young man and I served him until I was 30 years old. He said, I was active in my church. I loved God. And then I blew it all. I left my wife. I left my children. I left my faith. And he said, I'm 70 or 67 years old today. And I just came back to Jesus. I'm tired. The other guy said this. I have never heard this in my life. He said, I have never heard this about Jesus, his death, his resurrection, and that he's alive. I could be forgiven. I've never heard this salvation you talked about. I've never once in my life heard the salvation. 
The other guy, I'm sorry, I don't remember what he told me. But I, don't, I remember the first two. Hey, when Jesus said all, it's young, it's old, it doesn't matter. We have a job. We have a Jesus. We have a Savior who cares. Not only can we come to Him and be forgiven and come to Him and find rest and peace, we can point everybody else that we come in contact with to Jesus. Because I, could, I, can't, I can't fix you. I can't heal you. All I can do is be like hands and feet of Jesus and know Christ is in me, the hope of glory, and go about and let His light shine. Let His light, so, the, the light so shine before men that they'll see your good works. Good works follow the believer and they'll glorify our Father in heaven. Woo! Hi! Jesus said, come unto me, all who are weary. Heavy laden is burdened. That heaviness, sin is heavy. It's a burden of sin. And Jesus said, come unto me and I'll give you rest. But you know what Jesus said next? Jesus, it's really like, if you, want, if you like points, come, take, and learn. Jesus said, come. And then he said, Take. I'm going to tell you, there's a big difference between just coming to Jesus and taking what he has for you. There's a lot of people that come to Jesus, want to get the junk off the ship. They want to lighten their load. They want the rest and they want to feel better. And that's all good. That's what Christ is here for us. But let me tell you what he said next. Take my yoke. Uh, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> um, did you say take um, a, a fat bank account? No, take my yoke. See, they knew what a yoke was. When I was a kid, we had a, a basement in our house, a full basement, and we had a yoke hanging on the wall. And the yoke, is a, it was a wooden bar, and it had two big loops like this. And you would put it over the top of two oxen, and they would, then you would close it up over their necks, and you could plow a field with two oxen. It's a yoke. And with that, they would stay together. You could train them, and they could stay in sync because two are better than one. And the two of them would have strength to plow a field. So the yoke is not a bad thing. The yoke was to get the job done. There's not, a yoke is not wrong. But there are wrong yokes. Because Jesus said, come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden. And he said, I'll give you rest. And then he said, take. Take my yoke upon you. And here's the thing. We want to have his yoke, but we don't want to get rid of the old yoke. What? What are you talking about? Listen, it's interesting because in, in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus has come. He says, take my yoke. And then he said, learn of me. But you know what it leads up to? Chapter 12, where he's dealing with legalism. Where they had like 600 plus laws that were not a part of God's law, but man's law. And they were yoked to the law of legalism. And it's addressed in the next chapter. Hey, um, Caleb, come here, buddy. We'll be a little unequally yoked because you passed me up in height. This is my son, Caleb. He was up there rocking out on the base. So you put your, let's try it both ways. You put your arm around. Okay, that works. So this is like a yoke. Our arms are the yoke around, like we're like two oxen, right? And so here's the thing. Now let's not say we're yoked to oxen. The Bible says you can be yoked to the law. Like, like yoked teamed up with legalism and you're teamed up with legalism you're you're going around and you're you're working together legalism it's like oh no you you're you're showing too much skin you can't you can't get to heaven now wait a minute should we have modesty yeah we should have modesty but we need to walk around like a prude can't tell anybody about jesus unless they look just like come on legalism is legalism is all kinds of stuff i don't spend too much time on legalism but we can be Yoke to, you know what the Bible also says? We could be yoked to the flesh. You could be yoked to your flesh. In other words, what your body wants, what your, your five senses, what, you, what, your, what your emotions want, your mind, your will, your emotions, the soulless realm, that what it wants, it's going to get in your yoke to that. You're used to living off of emotions, feelings, not principles, not the Word of God. So you can be yoked to your flesh. The Bible says you can be yoked to the world, the devil, your flesh. Hey, there's a lot of yoking out there and some of it is wrong. Because some of us are teamed up with the world. Whew, I'm getting hot. Stay up here for a minute though. Oh my goodness. I got, my neck's a little burnt. I'm not used to being this close to the equator putting up a tent. <laughs> my neck is red. But, but anyway, a yoke can be useful and be good, but you've got to be yoked to the right thing. 
Jesus didn't say, come to me and let me free you of a yoke. Jesus said, come to me and take my yoke. Because you need to be teamed up with Christ. You can't just be teamed up to the world and to your flesh. That stuff needs to be broken off of you. You need to dump all the garbage off your ship. Give it to Jesus. Roll all the sin over to him. Give it all to him and say, Woo, I've been forgiven. I've been redeemed. You might wake up tomorrow and say, I still don't feel 100%. Well, don't just consult your feelings. Also consult the word of God. Stay in there. Keep hanging in there. God's working on you. He's going to help you. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't lose faith. Keep hanging in there. Find some good believers. Stay yoked to Christ. Come on. But you got to get rid of the old yoke. Here's what we want to do. We want to be yoked to Christ and the world. You know, he wants us to see that old yoke broke. Some are yoked to so many things that they were addictive things, addictive behaviors and stuff. And we're so yoked. Here's what a yoke is like. Let's try that again. So a yoke is like, well, I want to, I'm going to live for Christ. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go over there. And, and then that's my spirit, man. And then my flesh that I'm yoked to says, oh, no, you're not. You try going that way. And I'm going this way. And, we're, and we can't plow a field very well. And it sure ain't straight. You ever been in a three-legged race with somebody? Well, your legs are tied together. And I'm telling you, it don't work unless you're together with some teamwork. See, when you're yoked to the wrong thing and it's dragging you around, it's wearing you down. But when the yoke is broke, hey, I'm not yoked to the world, the flesh, or the devil. Hey, what breaks the yoke? I know one thing breaks the yoke. The Bible says the anointing breaks the yoke. Holy Ghost breaks the yoke. He said, no, wait, the anointing. Anointing and Holy Spirit are basically the same thing. Holy Spirit breaks the yoke. It's the anointing. It breaks the yoke. So see, you come to Christ and you say, I'm, I'm tired of living for the world, being tied to the world. I want to be yoked to Christ. And when you're teamed up with Christ... And you're going together with Christ. Let me tell you something about it. You are not doing this work alone. You're not serving by on your own power, your own strength. You're teamed up with Christ. And two are better than one. Hey! <laughs> and how many of you know a threefold cord is not easily broken? So when it's me and Jesus and Caleb, we're even more inseparable. You say, well, that, isn't that just supposed to be with your wife? Well, yeah, but also I'm yoked with my son. He still lives in my house. Now, someday he's going to leave and cleave. And that's what I got to let him do because that's what God called him to do. He'll leave me and he'll cleave to a woman of God and marry her. Right? Thanks. It's too hot for that. Too long. I heard of a missionary that had went out and he was watching out in a field, a young missionary learning from an older missionary. The older missionary said, what do you notice out in this field? That looks different. And he says, oh, I can tell you right now. There's a big ox and a small ox plowing that field, and they're unequally yoked. He said, I'm not a farmer. I don't know nothing about it, but they're unequally yoked. That yoke was lopsided. It wasn't working. The farmer said, yeah, but we're we're training a young ox and breaking it in. He said, because the big ox doesn't really need the little ox. And the big ox is moving. And the little ox, he said, watch it. The little ox would fight. It would resist. But the big ox kept going. And after a while, the little ox starts thinking, why don't I just give up, quit fighting this big ox? Why don't I just get in step? He's doing most of the work anyway. Why don't I just go along with him and do what he wants me to do the way he wants me to do it? And here's what we do. I want to be yoked to Christ. I want to be one with Christ. Oh, Lord, not, 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 not really your kingdom come. Your will be done. How, Lord, how about my will? I got a will. I got some wish list. I got things I want to do. And you're going this way. And the Lord's like, hey, I give you free will. You can go there. But when you decided to be yoked to me, buddy, we're together. So why are you fighting? Why are you resisting Holy Spirit? Why don't you just say, hey, Lord, I'm yours. Where you go, I'll go. What you say, I'll say. I'm yours. My life is in Christ. The best way to live is to be yoked together to Christ. See, I'm telling you what. I've been yoked to the world. I've been yoked to the law. I've been yoked to my flesh. And if I'm not careful, I'll go back to old yokes. Jesus came to break them. I got to learn to stay in sync with Jesus. And here's the cool thing. He's the big ox. I'm the little one. He could do this work without me. But if I'll link up with Christ, and Christ is in me, the hope of glory. See, I'm telling you what. It's unbelievable. you, You can't even fathom what all you'll be able to do through Christ. On our own, we can't do it. 
But with Christ, all things are possible. So I'm telling you what, that ship full of junk, toxic waste, I can roll it over. I can learn to say, okay, Jesus, I can get help and, 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 and work and have, give it to Jesus. And he gives me rest. But I got to be willing to take on the yoke. Then you know what he says? And learn of me. Folks, we got we got a lot to learn. <laughs> I've got a lot to learn. I, am I the only one in here that's stubborn at times? The only one in here that has a will of my own? Come on, right? I mean, look, I've, I have got to learn of Christ. He said, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy. You know what easy means? Useful. The other yokes are not useful yokes. His yoke is useful. My yoke is easy. And my burden is light. See, you'll still have a burden, but it's a light burden. Ricky, you ever feel burdened sometime and it's the burden of the Lord? Pastor, you ever feel the burden and it's the burden of the Lord? <laughs> Angie, you felt it. <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about, Christians, when... The Lord has called you, appointed you, anointed you, and there's a burden to do something, to pray for the lost, to do the work of God. But His burden is light compared to the burden of the world. The weight and the heaviness and the burden of sin, of the law and of the flesh. I don't know about you, but I want Jesus. I want to live for Him. I want to die for Him. I want to know Him the rest of my life. Folks, I'm going to tell you, it's the same for everybody. We can come to Jesus just the way we are, but we got to change. I come to Him like I am, but I'm leaving different. I come to Him and I say, Lord, I give it to You. Lord, I'm taking on You. Stand with me, would you? If you're able to stand. I was thinking about Paul, in the Bible, wrote like a third of the New Testament. You know, his name was Saul before he was called Paul. And you know, when he was persecuting the church and he had papers in hand where he had the authority to go and kill Christians and have, have Christians killed and locked up for preaching the gospel. And while he's on his way with an assignment, and he was yoked to the law. Listen, Saul was yoked to the law. He was, he was a leader of the law, yoked to the law. He was going with papers and hands, the law, to stop the church. How many of you know just because something's legal don't mean it's right? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> and just because it's right don't mean it's legal. They might make some things that are right, make it illegal, but we better follow God. You want to be yoked to the law or to Jesus? So... Here he is, and he's got an assignment. And as soon as that light appears, the Lord Jesus appears to him. He's knocked off of his horse. Those around him fall back, right? And what happens? Lord, what do you want me to do? I don't know about you, but in 1996, when I was at an altar, you know what I said? Lord, forgive me for running. Forgive me for acting like Jonah. Forgive me for hating Christians. Forgive me for my bitterness and my hatred. My grudges. And you know what he did? He forgave me. And the burden of sin lifted quickly. But then I was at that altar for 45 minutes more. Because now I had to die. Oh, forgiveness. I got forgiven and I knew I was forgiven. But then I had to die because the next thing the Lord said to me and I heard him clearly. He said, will you preach? And I had a whole list of things I would do and how I could do it, but that wasn't one of them. And then the Lord said, will you preach? And I said, Lord, again, I'll do this, I'll do that. And then finally when I said, Lord, yes. He told me where to go, gave me a person's name, it worked. It was amazing. God knows what's best. He's in charge. You might as well listen to the boss. You might as well listen to King Jesus. He's got the blueprint. That's the best blueprint for your life. 
Don't resist the Holy Spirit. Don't fight him. See, I had a yoke. And I had to be broke. I came to him. And all of that garbage and toxic stuff on my ship, I gave it. But then I had to take the assignment. And I'm going to tell you what Saul said. What would you have me to do? You know what Jesus did? Jesus put him on an assignment. And Jesus also said, I'm going to teach him what it is to suffer for my namesake. You know what it is to be on assignment. I, I don't think I've met you. Have you ever been here in the times past we came? I didn't think I'd ever met you. I was just out here shaking your hand was the first time, but you must know these cool people. Yeah, that's cool. You know what assignment's all about. God showed me the word and he showed me fire at the beginning and he showed me fire at the end. But what I saw was a flame of fire here, the word assignment, and a flame of fire here. Why as I walked over to you? And it was like the Lord said, I put fire in you when I called you, when I gave you, and there will be fire when you go out. There will be fire that carries you on, and you're going to end with a fire. You're not going out like fizzled. You're not going out frozen. You're going out with fire because you have an assignment and a call from God. And it's his passion that is in you. It is his fire that is in you. And you want more. And you want more. And you want more. And sometimes we don't know what to do or how to do it. But he does. And as we die and our will surrenders to his will, he says, here, put your hand out. He said, here's your papers, son. Here's your marching orders, son. And all we got to do is say, yes, sir. And the fire will keep burning. And the fire will burn, and the fire will burn, and the fire will burn. Woo. Man, I don't know what all God's got for you, but fire is involved. <laughs> fire is involved. Fire burns out all the stuff that shouldn't be. Fire illuminates. Fire draws a crowd. <sighs> there will be a whole different drawing. I'm not talking about this kind of drawing. I'm talking about people coming in. It's going to be a whole different kind of drawing of, you're going to notice like there's this, this, why, why are people being drawn? What, why are you bringing them to me? Because there's assignments and there's fire and they need the fire to burn. He set a fire in you. Huh, yeah! <laughs> hey, the fire of God! And that fire is what we need! The fire on the inside changes everything on the outside. <laughs> Lord, set a fire down in our souls. We don't want to contain it. We don't want to control it. We're yoked to you. Lord, put us on assignment. Tell us what you wanted us to do, and we'll do it. You might even be out there listening, and you're like, what is all this stuff about an assignment following God? Do I, how, how long do I have to do this or that? Call unto the Lord. Say, Lord, here's my life. I give you me. Lord, I'm ready for my marching orders. Because I'll tell you, I'm in the Lord's army. Woo! Hi! The life that I used to live, I'm not living anymore. The guy that I once was, I'm not anymore. Because Christ has set me free and set a fire. Yeah. Hey, God's given you assignments. Given you callings. So be ready.